Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back here to Keys to Christ Ministries. We're thankful that you can join us here for another Sunday afternoon Bible class. Today we are studying an important topic in our final series studying the true church of Bible prophecy. We're going to identify it clearly through history and trace it down from the book of Revelation chapter 12. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin our studies for this afternoon. Loving Creator, we thank you today that you have blessed us with breath in our bodies. We thank you today, Lord, that you have, by your mercy and by your faithfulness, kept us. We're thankful today, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, today that we can receive your word if our hearts are willing and sincere and open to receive the truth. We choose, Lord, to submit to thee. We choose to submit to your word as our guide, as our instructor, and the Holy Spirit as our, as our teacher. We submit our feeble minds and understanding and we choose to believe what the Bible says. Be with us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Be with in the individuals, be with the families, be with the congregations who are gathering together under the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he ever lives to make intercession for us, and we thank you that he will be here present with us through his representative, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today, friends, we open up as we continue our studies in the book of Revelation chapter 12. We've traced down a lot with the church of God from heaven all the way down until we've come to a place where we can clearly identify that God's church is going to be and has been found many times in the wilderness with the children of Israel. And also as Revelation chapter 12 brings out, which we will look at today, the church was found in the wilderness once again. And in the last days, God's faithful people will be found in the wilderness. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to examine verse number 2 as we open up here in Revelation 12 and verse number 2. The Bible says here in Revelation 12 and verse number 2. Start in verse number 1. Revelation 12 and verse number 1. It says this, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. We examined that last week. We seen that that sun being clothed with the sun is being clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Having the moon under the feet is being established and built upon the word of God and the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And we've seen that those twelve stars represent God's faithful people, even his apostles, even the 12 tribes of Israel, it represents the foundations, the pillars, the ground of truth that Jesus has built up himself, his church. And this woman, of course, is God's church that is encapsulating all these things, encapsulating the right righteousness of Christ, encapsulating the Word of God, bringing all of these things together, and this is what God desires and has given to His people. Verse number 2 of Revelation 12, the Bible says this, And she, or the true church, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Now, somebody's going to say that this woman travailing in birth, this is, this is literal. This is a literal woman travailing in birth, ready to be delivered. 
Friends, we have to understand that the church, though it was literally upon earth, has these, these are symbolic spiritual connotations that the Bible is bringing out in Revelation chapter 12. There are some literal things, but we have to understand the spiritual, that this woman or this church being with child cried. What is it talking about here? Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to notice verse 1 through verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 3. What is this woman that is travailing in birth, ready to be delivered? It says this in, Rev in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a, as a thief in the night. Verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as what? Travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. What is First Thessalonians encapsulating? What is Revelation talking about with this woman travailing in birth, ready to be delivered? It is speaking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. God's true church has always looked forward to the second coming of Christ. Remember in, in, in the book of John chapter 8, when Jesus was speaking to the Jews, he, was, he said that your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. Was it just talking about the first advent of Christ? No, it was talking about the second advent of Jesus as well. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham was a sojourner upon earth, that he was a pilgrim, that he, he was a stranger upon the earth, and he looked for a better country. He looked for a better country, friends. He looked for a place that is in heavenly, which he would receive and when Jesus comes back the second time without sin unto salvation to receive his faithful people, friends. So this travailing as a woman ready to be delivered is speaking about the church of God, the true church, hastening, looking forward to the second coming of Christ. It's not an afterthought to God's true church. Because... As, the, as Jesus laid down the plan of salvation, as He devised, He and the Father, as Jesus and the Father devised a plan to save man at any cost to themselves, the second coming is the, is the deliverance of God's people from this world of sin and iniquity. I want you to notice something. This plan of salvation that God laid down is not an afterthought either. Notice what John chapter 1 verse says. When did Jesus lay down with his Father the plan to not only create the world, but even the plan of salvation that if man sins, God would save him. Even by the sacrifice and intercession of Jesus Christ. Notice this, John 1. John 1. And let's look at verse number 14, verse 1. John 1 in verse 1, the Bible says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is this Word? Skip on down to verse 14 of John 1. Who is this Word? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This Word is Christ. Notice verse 2 and 3 of John 1. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Even the plan of salvation was made. It was devised by Christ, who in the beginning, eons ago, devised with His Father the plan to save Man, notice here, Revelation 13. Revelation 13. 
Let's be more specific when this plan was laid down. Revelation 13, and let's look at verse 8. Revelation 13, and let's examine verse number 8. Revelation 13 and verse 8. This plan of salvation for God's people. Notice this. Revelation 13 and verse 8. It says this, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So before even this world was, was formed, when this world was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, when Jesus and the Father were saying, we're going to create man. But as we think about this, as we are devising this plan, we're making a plan to save man. Even from the foundation of the world, Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. But I thought he, he died on the cross in 31 AD. Amen. Jesus did die on the cross in 31 AD. But because the plan was laid down and because God's promises are sure and they are immutable, even as the plan of salvation was laid down, Jesus died. If, you, if, if we can catch that understanding, Jesus died because God's promises are sure. Amen? Amen. Notice Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Colossians 1. And let's look at verse number 16. Colossians 1. And let's notice verse 16. Right after the book of Philippians, you have Colossians 1. And let's look at verse 16. It says this, For by him, or Jesus himself, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created by him and for him. Verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth, even with his own church, is the head of the body. He is the beginning. Christ is not only the the sun that the woman is clothed in. He is the moon under her feet. Because He is the Word of God. He is the foundation of the church. He created the church. He created the plan of salvation that through His life upon earth as a man, with a human nature like we have, with the propensity that we have, but he overcame in the flesh. Then Katya keeps hitting the camera. So. And also, through his death upon Calvary, through his resurrection, through Christ ministry in the holy and most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is the fruition of the plan of salvation that was laid at the foundation of the world, that was laid even before man was created. Amen? Amen. So now we have this understanding of the church even from the foundation of the world as well. Notice here, let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 and let's examine verse number 3. Revelation 12 and let's examine verse number 3. Revelation 12 and let's look at verse number 3. The Bible says this, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and a seven crowns upon his head. What is this denoting? Skip on down in verse and also look at verse number 
9, Revelation 12, and verse number 9. The Bible says this, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So in a primary sense, this dragon represents Satan. But this dragon not only represents Satan, but also a power through which Satan would work to seek to destroy God's church, even Jesus himself. And we get this clue and understanding from Revelation 12 and verse 3, that this great red dragon has seven heads and has ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Where do we see that before? A dragon, a power, a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Turn with me to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Daniel and Revelation, friends, are companion books. As they are read together, the understanding of one will be greater, especially as you study Daniel, you will understand Revelation. Daniel 7 and verse 20, by the Holy Spirit's power, Revelation 7 and verse number 20, the Bible says this, And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth, mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Now notice here, Daniel 7 and verse 23. It says this, Thus he say, said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Verse 24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. This beast found in Daniel 7 is representing the papal power, but it's also representing it's also representing the pagan Roman power that from the pagan Roman power, ten tribes or ten uh, those ten toes found in Daniel 2, those ten kings, those ten, the, the divisions of the pagan Roman Empire. So when we're looking in, in Revelation 12, the Bible again says in Revelation 12 and verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. This is representing pagan and papal Rome. Verse 4. Verse 4. And it says, And his tail, or the tail of this great red dragon, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born friends this has a literal th this this has a double application here in revelation 12 and verse 4. the bible says that th the tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven a tail according to Isaiah 9 and verse 15 represents deception, friends. It represents deception. So through this tail, this power, this great red dragon is going to draw the stars of heaven. We examined that in previous studies when we examined, when we looked at the um, division of Rome, the, the breaking up of pagan Rome, and how pagan Rome... Um, how pagan Rome lost its Caesars and so on, the stars representing the government, representing the, the, cele the celestial body symbolically, representing government, senates, Caesars, and so on, representing um, forms of government. Amen? We examined that in previous studies. But in Revelation 12 and verse 4, it says, And his tail, or this great red dragon's tail, drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, or the church, 
this, this, this worldly power of pagan and papal Rome stood before the woman, before the church, it says this, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. This specifically is, is, is speaking about when Jesus was born upon earth at his first advent and a power that was ruling at his time. What power was ruling in Jesus' time? Notice Luke 2. Luke 2. What power was ruling in Jesus' time? Then we can get this understanding that this power, this great red dragon, was seeking to devour the child, even the child of the church, even Christ. Christ created the church, but through the church, through the woman, Christ came into the world. The Son of God. Luke 2 and verse 1. Luke 2 and verse 1. It says this, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Who was Caesar Augustus? He was a Roman, a pagan Roman Caesar, who was ruling upon the earth when Jesus was alive. It was pagan Rome. Let's go to a second witness, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and let's look at verse number... John 11, hmm. Let's see if we can find it. John 11 and verse number 47. John 11 and verse 47. Because this is near the end of Jesus' life. After he had just raised Lazarus in John 11, the Sanhedrin council devised a plan to not only put Jesus to death, but to kill Lazarus. But notice the power that was ruling just before Jesus went to the cross. John 11 and verse 47, it says this, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Verse 48, If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And notice, And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. The Romans had power to do this. Why? Because they ruled over the then known world. In Christ's time, when Jesus was born, what happened in the book of Matthew chapter 2? When Jesus was born, wise men seen a star over Bethlehem, and as they had been studying the prophecies, especially the prophecy uh, that Balaam had, that a star shall arise out of Jacob, right? And as they studied this, they went to, they, they were seeking even God's people at that time, they came to Herod, and they said, Herod, we've seen a star over Bethlehem. We know that this star is speaking of a prophecy of a king that is to be born in Israel. And Herod was shocked. He knew this to be true, but he said, no king is going to take my throne. And he deceptively, through his tail, because Herod, though he uh, was ruling over Bethlehem and Judea and so on, he was a Roman he was, he was basically, he was a, a half, he was a mix between a Roman and a Jew. But he was ruling the Jews as a Roman. And as he sought to kill Christ, he couldn't because Mary and Joseph had fled into Egypt. And all the children of Bethlehem under two were killed or slaughtered by Herod or by the Roman power, but it was this Roman power that was seeking to destroy the child from its birth. Does that make sense? Now let's turn back here. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, friends. Because Satan, Jesus works through his church, but Satan works through powers upon the earth, even many kingdoms, to seek to um, rule himself. This is how he seeks to rule. This is how he seeks to rule. And 
when you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, the stone that is cut out without hands, representing Christ at His second coming, is going to destroy all of the false systems and kingdoms of this world. Jesus said to Pilate, in the book of John, I believe it's John 19, or it's John 18, one of those chapters, John 19 or John 18, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, or else my servants would fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. But he told the Sanhedrin, he said, when they said, I adjure thee by the living God, tell us who you are. Are you the Son of God? And he said, yes. But he said, nevertheless, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory. And the book of Revelation chapter 1 says that when Jesus comes, that those who pierced him are going to wail because they know they've rejected Jesus. They know they rejected God himself and they are going to wail because their destruction comes. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. In verse 5. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. The Bible says this. And she brought forth a man child. Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now somebody's going to say this must represent Mary. Because Mary is the one who God chose to um, birth Jesus. Is that true? Yes. But this woman is speaking about the church. Revelation 12 is speaking about the church, not a singular woman. Friends, there's a lot of deception. The, the, the Roman Catholic Church has even said that this woman is Mary. This woman is specifically Mary. But this woman represents the church, that God's true church would bring forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and then her child, or Jesus, would be caught up unto God and to his throne. Let's, let's, let's break that down a little bit. Let's break that down a little bit. Turn with me to the book of Genesis 3. Because we want to understand that this woman is not Mary. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And verse 16. Genesis 3, verse 15 and verse 16. This is the first messianic promise or the promise of a coming deliverer, or a promise of the Messiah, to come, and to what his work would be. Genesis 3 and verse 15. The Bible says here in Genesis 3 and verse 15, And I will put enmity, speak, God speaking to even the serpent, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his head, heel. Verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, when this promise was given, Mary, or Jesus' earthly mother, was not even created yet. But the Bible says that God was going to put enmity between Satan and and God's people, God's church. There would be enmity or a supernatural hatred that God would implant in the soul through the grace of God, through the word of God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, in God's people to actually hate sin and iniquity. Now, the Bible says that this this child would rule all nations with a rod of iron. Turn with me to Revelation 19. What is this speaking about? Ruling all nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 19 and verse 15. Revelation 19 and verse 15. We're going straight to the scriptures here today, friends. Revelation 19 and verse 15. It says this, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God of Almighty God. Turn to me to Psalms 2 now. Psalms 2. Psalms 2. This is speaking about Christ, 
who would rule all nations with a rod of iron. When would this happen? Revelation, Psalms 2, and let's look at verse 9. Psalms 2 and verse 9. The Bible says here, in Psalms 2 and verse 9, <clears throat> Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Jesus would rule all nations with a rod of iron. He would dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. What do we see on that image in Daniel 2? It's potter's clay. It's miry clay, right? Jesus is going to dash them in pieces. He's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 19, which we quoted from, which is, is connecting Psalms 2 in the book of Revelation, is speaking about Jesus' second coming. But Jesus is even ruling in somewhere right now. Jesus is ruling somewhere right now. Turn to me to Psalms 5. Psalms 5. Or, pardon me, Romans 5. Romans 5. This is at the king, kingdom of glory. When Jesus comes again at His second coming, this is known as the kingdom of glory. But right now, there is a kingdom that Jesus is ruling in, and that's called the kingdom of grace. Notice Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And let's look at verse 5. Romans 5 and verse 5. The Bible says this, And hope maketh not ashamed, because what? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. This kingdom of grace is a kingdom in which God, through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, implants His love or sheds it abroad or pours it out in our hearts. This kingdom of grace is received when we receive Christ into our heart. The Bible says in John 1 verse 12, And as many as received Him, as what? As a personal Savior. To them gave He, what? Power to become the sons of God. When we receive Christ as a personal Savior, we receive this kingdom of grace. Then we can come. And as we come to Jesus, we're coming boldly before what? The throne of grace. That we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why? Because we have a great high priest which is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we can come boldly before the throne of grace to receive this grace that teaches us to deny our ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we can live soberly, that we can live righteously, that we can live godly in this present world. And we receive that when we receive Jesus. When we receive Christ as our personal Savior, we understand we can't save ourselves. That all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We need the, to be clothed with the Son. We need to be clothed with Christ's garments. Turn me back to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. We examined part of Revelation 12 in our previous study, so we're not going to completely look at the whole entire book of Revelation 12. <clears throat> but I want to notice something here in verse number 6. Revelation 12 and verse number 6. The Bible says this. When, let's examine verse number 5 as well. Let's continue on verse number 5. And she brought forth a man-child, the church of God, God's true church, brought forth Christ into the world, not because He was created, but because this mystery that God will become a man. And this seed, Christ, would come through the woman, the church who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God. 
and to his throne. When was Jesus caught up unto God and to his throne? When you, when you look at the book of Acts chapter 1, let's notice this. Let's notice this. Let's go there. Acts chapter 1. Because Jesus died on, on Calvary's cross. Amen? And as Jesus died on Calvary's cross, three days later, what happened? He resurrected. But for 40 days, the Bible says, he spent with his disciples. And then what happened in Acts chapter 1? Acts chapter 1. And let's notice verse number... We'll start in verse number 8. But ye shall receive power, Jesus speaking to his disciples, to his apostles, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto, other, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Verse 9. And when he, Jesus, had spoken these things, while they, his disciples, beheld, he was taken up, or he was caught up. Where? And a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Where did Jesus, where were they, the disciples looking steadfastly towards? Heaven. Because Jesus was caught up to heaven at his ascension. That's when he went into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Verse 11. Which, said, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Speaking about the second coming, because the second coming has always been kept before God's people. It's always been kept before God's people. So Jesus was caught up into heaven, and guess what? When Satan seen, I could not overcome Christ on earth. I couldn't overcome him and kill him at his birth. I couldn't overcome him in, during his childhood and youth. I couldn't overcome him in the wilderness of temptation. I couldn't overcome him in his earthly ministry. I couldn't overcome him in Gethsemane. I couldn't overcome him on the cross. I couldn't overcome him at the tomb. I couldn't overcome him while he was on earth. Guess what? My attention turns to the woman, to his church. That's why the Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And have the testimony of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that because Satan could not overcome Christ, he turned his attention to the church. And this is where the war between the church comes about. Revelation 12, and it continues here into the wilderness. Revelation 12 and verse 6. Revelation 12 and verse 6. The Bible says this, And the woman, or the church, fled into the wilderness. Why? We're going to examine that. Where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand Two hundred and three score days. What is happening here? The woman fled into the wilderness? Why is she going into the wilderness? Why is she going to hiding? Why is she going into obscurity? Why is she going into secrecy? Because the Bible says that for a thousand two hundred and three score days, the woman would not be safe. What would happen for 1,203 score days? What would happen for 1,260 days? What would happen for 42 months? What would happen for a time, times, and the dividing of time? What would happen for a time, times, and, ha and a half a time? The papal church, the Roman Catholic church, the papacy ruled the world. And who was she seeking to devour? Who was she seeking to destroy, to mete out, to eradicate, to genocide God's faithful people what happened during the 1260 years what happened from 538 AD when Justinian gave when, when, when finally the third of those Aryan tribes of the Roman provinces was uprooted what happened the papacy finally gained control of Rome through that decree of Justinian, 
five years before, in 533, that the Pope is to be head of the church, he is to be head of even the nations, guess what? Five years later, once that third Aryan tribe was uprooted, the papacy began her supremacy in 538 AD. And for 1260 days, or biblically, biblical prophecy students, years, all the way to 1798, when her deadly wound was received at the hand of, the, of France, at the hand of General Berthier, under, under Napoleon, when the Roman, province, Roman provinces were taken away from the Pope, he lost his, his, his temporal power. But for 1260 years, she ruled the nations. She ruled the nations. And what did she do to God's people? During 1260 years, 50 to 100 million Christians died. Who's heard of the Waldenses? Who's heard of the Huguenots? Who's heard of the Albigenses? These are just a few. And even different Christians, Sabbath-keeping Christians in Africa were completely destroyed. Almost completely destroyed. There's still some, very few. Anyone that stood in the way of Rome and her power and her rulership over the nations and her standing in the place of God, she sought to kill. What pagan Rome was doing by force, she was doing by force, but under the guise of Christianity. How dangerous can that be? How dangerous can that be that we would take on the name of Christ, but do a destructive work, friends, like the papacy? This destructive work that she did. Revelation 12. We examine verse 7 through verse 9. That this is speaking about the war in heaven between Satan and Jesus Christ. With Jesus' angels and Satan's angels. The war came down to the earth. Let's look at verse number 10. Verse number 10. And it says this in verse number 10, because what, what we see here in Revelation chapter 12 is a, a spiritual, literal play on things. As 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 speaks about the mystery of, uh, the, um, without controversy, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And the mystery of godliness is a literal and spiritual happening. It's things happening upon the earth, things happening in heaven. Spiritual things in heaven, literal things upon earth. And even the mystery of godliness, that the divine power of God would work through with and cooperate with the human effort of man. This mystery of godliness So when we're looking at Revelation 12, we are seeing things happening on earth at Christ's first advent. Things happening on earth during the 1260 years of papal supremacy. Things happening in heaven between Satan or Lucifer at the time and God. And then things happening back on earth. So for, for the Bible student, there needs to be uh, diligent searching to, to, to see what is going on here. Or Revelation chapter 12 will get very confusing. Let's notice verse 10. Revelation 12 and verse 10, it says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accuse them before God day and night. The name Satan means adversary. Devil means adversary. Satan accuser. 
Satan is an accuser of the brethren, and he's even an accuser of Jesus Christ himself. He did it in heaven, and he came to seek and do it on earth. But the Bible says that the accuser of our brethren is cast down. When was Satan cast down? When was Satan cast down? Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, I will what? Draw all men unto me. Jesus said on the cross, as he was breathing his last breath, what did he say? It is finished. Satan, you are cast down. Because on the cross, the controversy between Jesus Christ and Satan, this climax point where the angels finally seen, whoa, when Satan was telling me all those, he was talking about creating a new government and me, me, me ruling over and, and not God anymore. When he was talking about leaving heaven and starting a, our, own, our own power, this is the fruit of the work of Satan was to even kill Jesus, even kill our commander. And when the angels seen that Satan would kill and, and, and that what his desire was, was as a murderer from the beginning. When sin came into his heart, when he held on to that pride and that selfishness and that vanity, murder sprung up in his heart. And the angel said, we can no longer sympathize with Satan. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. Satan's character has been revealed. Where? At the cross of Calvary. At the cross of Calvary. Satan was defeated. He's a defeated foe. Why be on his side? He's a defeated foe. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And verse 12. Revelation 12 and verse 12, we'll come back to verse 11. Revelation 12 and verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So now because Satan could not conquer Christ again, he's seeking to conquer God's people. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth, Satan knows his time is short. Satan knows, I only have a little time to destroy and to deceive this world, and not only this world, but to e even seek to deceive the very elect. Verse 13, Revelation 12 and verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. 1260 years of papal persecution. Persecution, even in pagan Rome. This is what Satan sought to do. He said, I'm going to destroy God's people. I'm going to destroy that even the least of these. I know that if I destroy even the least of God's followers, I'm doing it even to Jesus. He sought that I'm still going to cause pain to the heart of Jesus. If I can't physically kill him and keep him dead, I'm going to do it to his people. But the Bible says, fear not man, which is able to kill the body, but not to destroy the body and the spirit and the soul. Satan can only cause physical harm and pain to God's people. He can torment mentally, but he cannot cause us to lose hope in God. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 41, it says, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. When Satan comes to charge upon us and say, Look, at your filthy garments, we can say, though I'm, yes, I'm a sinner, but Jesus Christ came to die for sinners, of whom I'm chief. I am a brand plucked from the fire. Men burned at the stake, friends. Men tor tortured in coliseums 
on, on the rack at the guillotine because they stood for Christ. But what did they sing? In their dying breath, singing, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Singing, saying, open the king of England's eyes, interceding for even their own enemies as Stephen did. Lay not this sin to their charge. The true spirit of God's people was seen. And even the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself, his character was even more vividly seen in the testimony of God's people. Notice Revelation 12 and verse 11. Revelation 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him, Satan, by what? The blood of the Lamb. Because what does the blood of Jesus do? It cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 and verse 7. But can it cleanse us from sin? If we choose to live in sin, no, it can only cleanse us from sin if we choose to renounce our sins. If we choose to allow them to be placed on Jesus. If we choose to give our sins to God. If we choose to say, Lord, take me. Take my heart for I cannot give it. And they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They loved not their lives even unto the death, friends. Do we love life, our temporal lives, more than death. And you might say, well, of course I want to live. Of course we do, friends. But Paul said, to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul said, I die daily. What was he dying to? Self. What was he dying to? Sin. He was overcoming by the blood of Jesus and by the word of his testimony. His testimony was. Notice this. What, what was Paul's testimony? Second Timothy. This testimony can be ours today. Second Timothy 4. We can die daily. We can die to sin and selfishness. If we choose. Second Timothy 4 and verse 8. Verse 7. Second Timothy 4 and verse 7. Paul speaking even before he was about to die at the hands of pagan Rome, Nero. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, Paul didn't think about just himself getting that crown of righteousness, but unto all them also that love is appearing, the second coming. Do we love Jesus appearing? Are we hastening Christ's second coming? Or are we dreading it? Are we fearing it? Are we saying, guess what? I'm not ready. And, and, and I'm not ready to be ready. Friends, we can choose today to say no more of that. Think of what it means to say no to Jesus. Think of what it means to say, to walk away sorrowfully, rather than to give all. Like that widow who gave too much, she gave all her living. Are we willing to give all for Christ? He gave all for us. He gave all for us, always asking, is this for that sin-polluted heart? He says, just let me take it. Just consent to let me take your heart. Verse 14, Revelation 12 and verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. This is deliverance from God. When you look at Deuteronomy 32. That she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished. Satan could not wipe out all of God's people. She is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face 
of the serpent. God's people protected for that 1260 years of papal supremacy. And as we will examine next week, friends, we're going to examine next week the mark of the beast. We're going to see that that power that received a deadly wound in 1798, the papacy, their wound will be healed. And through the miracle working power of Satan, this threefold union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet will seek to work, working miracles. We're going to go forth to the kings of the earth to cause those who will not yield to her mark of authority that they should be killed, friends. Are we ready to die today? Because if we die today, we don't have to die a martyr's death. If we die today, we will be nourished, friends. We will be nourished. This is the nourishing power. The Bible says, Jesus said that my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To finish the work. To finish our course. To fight the good fight. To keep the faith. While many are letting go of Christ, where many are giving up on the faith once delivered to the saints, we can hold on to Christ's garments. We can hold on. And even though our experience might be in the mountains and in the tombs, sit down, even though we might be wrestling like Jacob, don't let go. Just like Jacob, say, I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you bless me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've examined the true church today. We've seen that that true church was persecuted for 1260 years. We've seen that the true church overcame through the blood of the Lamb and through the word of their testimony. That the true church is those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, not nominally, not just because they have the name on the church building, but this true church in the last days, Lord, is your true Seventh-day Adventist people. It is the true people who are looking and hastening the second coming of Jesus by watching for souls as they that much give an account, as watching unto prayer, as watching these times and seasons, preparing their hearts, preparing their homes, preparing others, Lord. Help us not to be found like the disciples sleeping in, the, in Gethsemane, but help us to have that experience of Gethsemane, to watch and to pray that we enter not into temptation. Lord, our flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. Please give us the victory you gave to your Son, we choose to receive this victory and to truly be commandment keepers. Write your law in our hearts that it would change our characters, our demeanors, the way we talk, the way we think, the way we act. Lord, to wrought a complete change in our lives and characters. We pray and we ask and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, next week, by God's grace, Next week, by God's grace, we come back for another Sunday afternoon Bible class as we will examine the great old question that's going around all over the world right now. The mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? We're going to examine it next week by God's grace. So join us if you want to support the ministry. Um, please message us. We'll send us you a link where you can support financially. Please continue to support through your prayers that the work can go forward by God's grace, and we will keep you in prayer as well by God's grace. Maranatha. Maranatha.